if you're recording, we get royalties, right? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I see that folks are trickling in, but we're going to go ahead and begin just for the sake of time. I want to make sure everyone has a chance to present their entire programs. Um, the Office of Innovation and Strategic Initiatives wants to welcome you to our very first Two Gen Lunch and Learn. This session is being recorded. So if there's anything that you happen to miss or you wanna share with a colleague, please be sure to go to our Fusion page and check out a copy of this recording. All right, it is filling up really quickly. So, well, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Kiara Crawley, and I'm the Innovation Analyst with the Office of Innovation and Strategic Initiatives. And I'm joined by my colleague, Will. Afternoon, everybody. Just gonna get our presentation up here in just a moment. All right. There we go. All right. Can everybody see the screen? All right. Seeing some head nodding. Wonderful. All right. And my name is Will Cochran, and I serve as the Innovation AmeriCorps service member with OISI. All right. All right. So let's get started with why we are here. So as most of you are aware, our commissioner released our agency profile last year, the very first agency profile, and it included our revised mission and goals and a strategic framework. Um, and although 2Gen wasn't explicitly stated, mentioning of utilizing a whole family approach appeared a few times, specifically in our goal one, which is to ensure safety and stability for children, adults, and family, and in goal three, which is to improve and integrate human services. And I wanna make the note that our executive staff does support the 2Gen framework um, as the tool we're going to use to realize our whole family approach. Now, what is 2Gen? We all know it's, it's nothing new. We, we know there's, all, there's never anything new under the sun. But uh, 2Gen is a very strategic effort to service the children and the adults in their lives. It incorporates five key principles, which are to measure and account for outcomes for both children and their parents, engage and listen to the voices of families, ensure equity, foster innovation and evidence together, and to align and link systems and funding streams. In addition to those five principles, there are six key components. And if you were present for any previous 2Gen presentations, you'll notice that um, there's been an update to these six key components before the early childhood education and K through 12 education pieces uh, showed up as one component, but now they've been broken into two so that folks can go more in depth to their specific needs. So in addition, in addition to those educational elements, we have post-secondary and employment pathways, economic assets, health and well-being, and social capital. All right, y'all. So we have a live poll question here uh, that you can access using your camera, pulling that up and um, looking at the or accessing the QR code in the top left corner here or joining at slido.com using the access code below 241164. And we wanted to ask based off what Kiara said to see, we wanted to take a straw poll to see whether or not your agency has a program that includes all six of the previously mentioned two gen key components. And those key components, just as a reminder, are early childhood education, K through 12 education, post-secondary and employment pathways, economic assets, health and well-being, and social capital. Do you have all six in one program? All right, so we'll take another moment here and let a couple more answers come on in. Got 
Got over 20 responses in already. That's great. Thanks, y'all. So we'll, we'll keep going as some responses are coming in. But as we can see from the initial results, although 2Gen is not a new concept, not a lot of folks have programs with all six components. So as we move forward with this work, we're, our goal is to try to bring programs that may have two, three, or four of the components into having all six. And further, many programs exist along what we call a 2Gen continuum. So while a 2Gen approach represents an integration of these service delivery systems to children and the adults in their lives, we did want to recognize that many existing programs across the Commonwealth fall under one of the two intermediate stages illustrated in the graphic here, either a program with child, that's child focused with parent elements or a parent focused with child elements. The great news of advancing 2Gen in Virginia is that we're not starting at square one. Your agencies have gone above and beyond to respond to your customers' needs in innovative and effective ways, especially during COVID. So in advancing 2Gen in Virginia, our goal is to bring programming closer to the center of this continuum as both time and resources allow. So now we'd like to show you an overview of the timeline for this 2Gen implementation process to place this lunch and learn in a larger context. So our process really kicked off in the fourth quarter of 2020 with a three-part series of 2Gen convenings. These convenings formally introduced the 2Gen approach and created a space for participants to share their experiences with 2Gen and to share ideas for how to overcome barriers in implementation. We kicked off this LDSS implementation process in earnest with a 2Gen survey sent out to all 120 local offices March 8th this year. Our main goal with the survey was to center the input and the experiences of your local DSS office at the very outset of this ideation process. And we wanted to be explicitly clear with our intention with that. And then from that point, we wanted to build upon the insights gathered in the survey process with more in-depth interviews, not only with locals that responded to having two gen programming in the survey, but from one, all 120 local offices. We've just begun this interview process and will continue throughout the summer. So be on the lookout for an email from either Kiara or me looking to schedule an interview. And after survey results indicated that a lack of knowledge on the 2Gen approach constituted the largest barrier to implementing 2Gen programming, we decided to organize a series of lunch and learn peer learning events, the first of which we are all at right now. And all of this will culminate in our ideation session events. These two workshops will serve as catalysts for strengthening and scaling 2Gen across the Commonwealth through both innovative and strategic initiative pathways. So without further ado, we want to go ahead and pass the presentation along to our uh, special guests. We're going to start with Sharon Rochelle, who is the director of the Powhatan Department of Social Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for this privilege uh, to be able to share our two gen program in Powhatan County. I will be perfectly honest um, until Kiara sat down and Will sat down with me and I was able to explain what our program was about. I really didn't know that it was a two gen program. So, um, so I fully support if you get an email from them to sit and have that discussion with them. Um, it was very helpful for me to see um, what we were able to accomplish. So, um, so we um, we started uh, we started with a, a needs assessment in our county, and um, what we found from the needs assessment is we had two major areas, although there were more, but two major areas. Uh, one of which was. Um, housing uh, issues, and one was transportation. And sorry, Sharon, we're working behind the scenes to yeah, get you. Yeah. Yep, that's okay. Sorry about that. For you. Um, so we started a um, volunteer driver program. So um, that was up and running. Um, especially important during the COVID-19 pandemic, but we really lacked housing resources for folks. And by that, I mean, not just um, for homelessness purposes, but affordable housing in Powhatan. So it's very difficult for people 
to be able to find a home um, who is especially young people starting out or um, someone that has been displaced because of eviction or other reasons. So we put our heads together to say, what could we do um, rather than sending them to a hotel um, for two weeks? How could we keep them in our county, be able to have them engaged with services in our county and you know provide them some type of success um, on the receiving end and do some case management with them. Um, so what we were able to do is we actually, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we had um, a family uh, offer us $250,000 as a donation um, to be able to help people from becoming homeless. And we had the flexibility flexibility to use that money as we saw fit. So we had multiple uses for that money. Um, so we needed, we had seniors with really, really terrible uh, home repair issues that really shouldn't have been living in the house, but due to the fact that they didn't want to leave their home, they lived there their whole life, they just wanted to age there, um, they were allowed to stay there. We had victims of domestic violence that were, you know, displaced from their home quickly. Um, one of the issues with that is if we had a, um, a victim of domestic violence who did not fall within the financial guidelines, we really had no place for them to go. Um, we do have homeless individuals, people that end up for whatever reason, um, losing their home. Um, some people have come to our county homeless, um, especially some families. And usually what will occur is the child will um, be registered at Powhatan School and will find out that actually the family is living out of the car. So we needed it to say, how could we meet all of these needs um, and still have it be effective? So we were able to use that money to actually purchase a home in Powhatan County. And we um, looked at property that had the ability that if we wanted to put a second home on there at some point down the road, we would be able to do that. Um, so the property that we picked out actually is a six acre parcel. Um, and um, although this initial purchase um, has helped, we also see down the road that we're going to need another place and and fairly soon. So um, next slide. So there was a little um, ambivalence on the side of some people when we talked about purchasing this house, saying, well, people aren't gonna want a place like this in their backyard if there's domestic violence or homelessness. Um, however, I will tell you that the response that we've gotten from our community has been just the opposite. We've had, in addition to the Curtis family uh, donating that initial money, the Powhatan churches have come together. You know, what can we do to help? They've um, funded, they've done walks um, and looked for other ways to be able to support the Hope House. Um, the Rotary Club has been extremely generous with us, but the community as a whole have stepped up. We've had private donors that have just given us money. Uh, so we'll not only be able to, our hope is to sustain this house, but to be able to either build another one or purchase another one, because what we've learned is we've really needed this. So currently um, we purchased the home in November. Um, I think probably about a month after we purchased the home, there were some things that we needed to do. There's um, a pond on one side of the property. So we wanted a fence in the yard to make sure there weren't any issues um, around the pond and just downspouts and a couple of odds and ends. But I would say the week after we finished our repairs, uh, we had our first family move in. Um, it was a mom and her five children who had been displaced due to domestic violence. Next slide. Um, so she's actually um, moved out 
or is in the process of moving out, we have worked with her. She is not returning um, back to her original home. Um, instead, she has purchased her own home closer to where her parents are for support. Um, you, you can imagine with five children, doing it on your own is very difficult. Um, so we're really being supported by the community. Um, we did not use the entire $250,000 from the Curtis donation. So we still have some money left. And also we've, um, as I said before, we have actually had some of our community organizations adopt Hope House as their designated char charity. So we have um, the Women's Club. Um, there's a lady who um, would like to come in and decorate the house for the different seasons, plant flowers in the yard um, to make it home-like. And that's really our purpose. We, we chose a ranch. I have some pictures of the house uh, coming up, but we chose a ranch that would be able to be used for multi-purposes. So um, we have worked with our um, community. If we had someone in a wheelchair, we would be able to put a ramp on the porch so that they would be able to get in and out of the house. And the fact that it's all on one floor um, would be very easy for someone to move in. We also thought, okay, a family with children. So the house has three bedrooms and two full baths. Um, and so even with these five children that have moved in, it's been you know, more than enough room for them. Um, and looking at some of the people that might move in there temporarily um, until their home repairs are done, um, you know, we've, we've just tried to be really cognizant of the fact that there's going to, we need to, we need to get something get, that can be used for multiple purposes. So, um, so far we've, we've, what we've used and what we've done, we've, it's difficult because of never having done this before, trying to think of everything that you might need. Um, but, you know, just getting the house stocked with food, um, the people that we purchased the house from left most of their furniture as a donation, and it was all in excellent condition, so um, we kept that. It has a washer and dryer, so someone does not have to go to the laundromat. Um, we put in a telephone, and it does also have internet, which for all of Powhatan County, that's not always possible, so... We, um, we were able to do that as well. Next slide. So there's our house. Um, that's actually the front. Um, and um, typically um, that front porch is just used to come out. And if you were to look at this house from the road, that would be what you would see, but it's actually kind of tucked in around some trees on top of a hill. So someone wouldn't necessarily see it from the road. Um, and we also are installing security cameras, um, both for, um, because the house is isolated, if anybody, you know, when the house is empty, that someone would be able to um, take a look if anything was going on. But also in the case of domestic violence, if somebody did find the house and started coming up the driveway, um, we took it off of the GIS system, so it does not show um, that this property is ours um, in case somebody decided to look on there and try to find the home. So we thought of that as well. Next slide. So um, this is the fencing we've put around. Um, again, this is the front of the house. And actually, if I stood back um, closer to the road, the pond is actually on the other side of this property, but this, as I said before, it sits on top of the hill. And even though the property itself is not treed, there's trees around it, which kind of gives it a little bit of a camouflage up there. Next slide. And that's just another picture of the fencing we put around. Next slide. <laughs> so this is the inside of the house. I wish I had more pictures, but, um, this is the kitchen area. And then on the other side, the front door, you can see off to your left and the living room. And then there's two bedrooms and a bath on one side of the house. Um, and then on the other side of the house is a, a full bedroom with a, um, a full bath off of it. Um, 
what you see in front of you is the dining table with just a few of the don donations that we've received. Um, they just keep coming in, um, mostly all new things, although people have donated some used, most everything um, is coming right from the department store. So we've been very fortunate. Next slide, just more donations. And the last slide. Thank you. So um, that's our that's our little house. Um, as I said before, we're hoping to expand to a second home. Um, and um, just I, I'll just throw this out there because I think my time is up. But um, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this project. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of maybe using a storage container home for the second house on the property, which is kind of out of the box, but there is a family, a woman who does storage container homes, and it would be ideal for putting it on this property. So that's really where we're looking for the second home is to be able to use one of those. And I will tell you that when these homes are finished, they are absolutely gorgeous. That's my retirement home. <laughs> so um, we're, we're really looking forward to working with her and looking at the possibility of a second house. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Sharon. I recognize that um, out of the six key components that you are really strong with the social capital um, aspect, as well as the health and well-being and even economic pathways. So thank you so much for um, sharing with us today. My pleasure. And we're going to reserve our Q&A time for the end because I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to present. So we will pass it along to Rusty Jordan from the Isle of Wight Department of Social Services. Why is it, it's always so hard to find the mute button when you wanna turn it off, right? Hi, I'm Rusty Jordan, Isle of Wight Director. And um, we, we, we're taking a, a little bit of a, a different approach. As Kara had said in the beginning, you know, you've got the, the three areas that qualify. And then when you look at the graphic, you find that there's, there's this whole host of things that uh, center around what Gen 2 is. And one of the things that concerned me when I saw the survey is everybody thinks that they're not doing Gen 2. When Gen 2 is not a new philosophy, what it's doing is, is it's wrapping up a bunch of philosophies that believe it or not, we've all been doing. It's just, we've been, it's either been separately, uh, it's never really been consolidated. So I'm gonna share my screen with you now. And uh, so we took a little bit of a different approach on how our presentation looks. So as said, it's Isle of Wight County Department of Social Services to Gen. And um, of course, here's the two Gen model. And as Kara was saying, they split the education, but if you notice there's there's things like early childhood education. And I know everybody out there has been doing childcare, child development. Uh, we're all involved with the schools, especially now that schools is gonna take over. Uh, Department of Education has taken over childcare for the most part. Uh, economic assets. Every one of the local agencies are out there doing budgets and things like that. Health and well-being as to what you're doing and then your social capital. So there's a couple of projects that I just yanked out that we're doing in Isle of Wight that have segments of two gen in them. One is, and this, is, this has been since the very start, and I think most agencies do this, we take a holistic approach when our clients walk in the door. When a client walks in the door, they may only be looking for food stamps, but our eligibility people are taking a look at them and determining what else they might be qualified for, or what other avenues can we assist them with? See, because as Will shared in his screen, as he shared in his screen, sorry, I thought I turned that off. As Will shared in his screen, he had the child services, um, excuse me, child folk, child focus. I got to turn that thing off. Uh, he had that, that, that it's channel, child focus, uh, child centered, family focused, or vice versa. But for many of us out there, what we've been doing is we've been doing a child-centered, child family-focused program. And then in Isle of Wight, we added something to it. And that would be above that centered thing in his graph. And that is community impact. Because you can, you can do this all day long, but the bottom line is, is what are your programs doing 
that have a community impact on them. All right, our second thing is our fiscal management, our companion, and then we have our companion service provider program. In our fiscal management, when we do our budget, we talk to our administrator and our board about how our finances impact the community that we serve. And then in our companions provider services program, it used to be that people could get into that program and they would be in that program forever. And what we found is we were only serving 9% of the known population. And I would venture to say that for most local departments, that's true. Because if you're doing adult services, you know, it's over the age of 60 or 18 and above with a physical or mental disability. Those numbers are not easily accessed. In fact, a lot of it, if you're in a rural area, a lot of your older 60 numbers are not necessarily coming into your local departments. So it's hard to know what that total number is. But one of the things we're looking at there and why we're taking a, a Gen 2 approach to our adult services programs is because we know that in 2030, according to the Weldon School of, of um, Cooper School of Business, is we're going to be at 41% of our population will be over the age of 61. So if 41% of our population is over, and then you've got that 18 and over with a physical disability, and then you subtract out the number in the population that are under the age of 18 and not part of the voting block, we're talking a rather large voting block population in our adult services. And yet the program, the way we had originally designed it without looking at the Gen 2 side of it, was only serving 9% of the population. And then the final thing is childcare. And we're running a unique program there in that one of the things we're doing is we're working with our economic development. During COVID, we found that there wasn't a lot of childcare, especially for our employees that we were making essential workers or for all the essential workers in the county. There wasn't a lot of childcare available. So it became critical that we figure out how we were gonna do this. And one of the things we found is for example, we only have five childcare providers in our county. Yet 15 of our families that are receiving subsidized are going to let neighboring counties for their childcare. That's lost revenue to the county. All right, so one of the, I wanted to take you a different way. This was our fiscal impact model when we talk about our direct spending. And this is true pretty much of all. You have your employee's salary, uh, started from the left, going to the right. And then that goes into the shops in Isla White and that. If you talk to economic development, every dollar earned in, in, in Isla White or any county for that matter, changes hands a minimum of four times before it leaves the county. Then you look at our direct purchase of supplies. Well, we always try to buy from our local vendors first. And then there's sometimes where we can and those purchases are made to businesses outside. So there's no community impact outside that for our economic. When we look at two gen projects, these are the things we look at. We look at the project as, as the project as a whole. We look at our values, which is uh, the acronym is ROARS. Um, we look at what are our policy objectives. We look at what are the mandates around that program and then what's the environment. And in the environment, you also have to include What's the politics behind that environment when you're trying to implement a project? The next step we're looking at is we wanna make informed decisions. It's always better when you make an informed decision and, and you can see if you look on the right side, it says informed on the left side, it says uninformed, but you've gotta have your data and your information, which means you've gotta have a means of collection. You gotta know what your policies and procedures are. And one of the things we're striving very hard here is anything that we're doing, we're putting in a standard operating procedure. So that way, if somebody's not here tomorrow, they know, or at least they have the start of what you would call a cookbook approach as to how to implement or where it is in its implementation. Then you have knowledge and analysis. You've, you, you, you've got to analyze what it is. We've already looked at our adult services numbers. We knew that if we were only serving 9% of the known population, we weren't reaching everybody out there. And then you have to make a decision on how you're going to, how you're going to mold that project. Another model that we use, and this gets into the, the whole best decision-making process, is you know you have attitude and, develop, uh, and behavior of the community, of the employees, everybody, we're, we're human beings. And human beings, for the most part, don't like change anyways. But then you have to look at what your organization culture is. Do you have the schools, the, the skill set to move to a Gen 2? In other words, do you have a full understanding of what those impacts are gonna be, and that you have the data and reports 
you have to then you have to then the interpretation of that and then we call the PIP, the state has always done that, a program improvement process. So we're looking at all of our programs in the Gen 2 light, and that's that's where we look at our program improvement, is how can we make every program we're doing here, when people walk in the door, how can we improve that process for them? Then we're looking at what are our building blocks to excellence? And of course, you start at the bottom. You gotta have the resource management, you gotta have the resources to do it. Uh, it, it was nice to get that donation for Sharon. I would have, I would love to get a donation like that. Um, then you've got to look at what your base case data is. And then you've got to decide what you're going to do to achieve that administrative excellence. Because if you're, if you're, if you're, if your workers, if your staff are not on board, you're going to miss one of those two gen gears that make the program work. And then the big thing is, and this is, this is where the excellent comes in, is what's your clients, what's your clients outcome? not an output there's a difference and and we forget this because of strategic planning outputs are easy it's you create this widget you you build it you create it it's an output but we're talking societal out, outcomes in other words are we reducing homelessness we too have a, a homeless program that's just started in this area and we're looking at it this way as well everything we're doing now we're connecting to those two gen gears. Have we hit every one of those areas? And you may not hit all the gears at all times that are in that that are in that uh, that diagram. But one of the things we were talking about is in homelessness is a lot of how are we getting them off the street? How are we finding places for our homeless? But if we don't stop, if we don't turn off the valve, we can get all the people that are currently on on that are homeless in placement. But if you don't turn off that valve on how they how they're becoming homeless, you haven't you haven't achieved you haven't achieved a societal outcome. And that concludes Isla White, Department of Social Services to Gen. We took a little bit of different approach in our in our presentation, and that was to give you a touch on the different things we're looking at. But the reason why I wanted to do that is because that survey showed that people think that they're not doing it. It's not a matter of not doing it. What you've got to do is you've got to figure out what all those gears are in the diagram and then implement them into your programs. But I guarantee you every local department out there is doing most of those items to begin with. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Rusty. Um, one thing I want to highlight is that you did mention um, sort of an intergenerational approach, which is essential when doing 2Gen. Again, you're looking at your adult services, but then you're also considering how it may connect to other programs like your child care services. So thank you for yeah, that. It, well, it, and I, I think I got a little more time. Uh, the, the key thing there that we're doing is we're working with our economic development and we're looking at trying to find an entrepreneur or uh, a philanthropist that wants to come in and build a child development center. You know, when I talked to my economic development guy at first, he said, well, you know, Rusty, when this is over, everybody's going back to work. And I said, are they? It seems to me that everybody's staying in their homes. And you have to understand, Isla White is a farm bedroom community with a lot of cities around it. And so if they're staying in their home, because his point was, most people want their child care by where they work. But if they're staying in their home, where do they want their child care? By their home. So this is a bit of supply and demand that we have to meet in order to establish that. But the one point that I think is really important that we've realized is, is it's not just child-centered, family-focused. You've got to make sure that whatever you're doing has that community impact. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. And that's the perfect- I yield to you, David. <laughs> I was going to say that's the perfect se uh, segue to Newport News because I, I truly believe their programs exemplify what it means to be um, community involved and oriented. So without further ado, I wanna pass it along to Ms. Shardell Gerald, David Duck, and Ms. Sonia Mitchell. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kiara. My name is Shardell Gerald, as Kiara said, and I'm the Chief of Prevention and Self-Sufficiency Services for the Newport News Department of Human Services. And as Kiara said, I'm joined by David Duck, our Youth Programs and Outreach Supervisor, and Sonia Mitchell, who's the unit coordinator for our extension office. 
And we're very excited to share information about our programs that have elements of the two gen whole family approach to service delivery. Because we too also think that everyone is doing it and just didn't know what it was called. There's now a name for it um, that identifies the work. For the most part, our children, youth, and families that participate in our programs do so voluntarily. Our programs are considered primary prevention, which are services designed for the general population, or secondary prevention programs, which are designed to support children, youth, and families that may be experiencing one or more multiple stressors that impacts their quality of life. And so in our bureau, we are comprised of three different units. David is gonna talk a little bit about our Family Empowerment Partnerships Unit, while Sonia is gonna cover some of the services in our extension office. I'll start with our Family Support Partnerships Unit since they're gonna cover the other, the other two. The Family Support Partnerships Unit includes healthy families and parents as teachers, which are our nationally recognized evidence-based home visiting programs. Our home visiting programs are designed to prevent and reduce child abuse and neglect and help to prepare children and their families to enter kindergarten ready to learn. We serve families prenatally through the age of five. And we're also very um, lucky to have a exclusive partnership with our local community services board, which allows us to provide targeted case management services in combination with our parents as teachers program where we are able to serve families who are at risk of serious mental illness or serious emotional disturbance um, using a targeted case management service delivery model. And we're able to then serve those children and those families up until they're seven years of age. So our home visiting programs are focused on improving maternal and child health and developmental outcomes, as well as we incorporate strategies and goals to support the dads and fathers in those households as well. Our staff are trained to work with parents, the target child, other children and family members that live in that home, um, and that would likely have an impact on the target child's healthy development. And so for instance, our home visitor may complete a child developmental screen using the ages and stages questionnaire with the parent and child, and the screen results may indicate that there's a possible developmental delay. That home visitor would work with the family to identify if there were additional assessment that was needed um, and find the additional services that may be needed to help um, address the developmental delay. The parent um, may be experiencing mental health challenges um, as revealed by an Edinburgh depression screening tool that all of our home visitors are trained to implement and that is a standardized implementation. Um, and if that resulted in a positive screen, then again, the home visitor would work with the adult in the family to connect them to mental health supports in our community. We have a mixture of funding um, that supports our home visitation programs. Um, as you can see on the screen, it includes city general funds, um, our Virginia Department of Social Services grant, a grant from the Virginia Department of Health which is our Maternal Infant Early Child Visiting Grant. And because of our collaboration with the local community service board, um, Medicaid targeted case management um, funds are available to support our service delivery model. We have five teams totaling 29 staff. Our resource team is responsible for recruiting and screening families for our home visiting services. And we have four home visiting teams that are responsible to provide the intensive um, ongoing uh, services in the home. Um, and that frequency generally depends on um, the time that the time period, the enrollment of the family, um, as well as what the model may indicate is required because there are model requirements that we must adhere to um, for service frequency. Staff are required to participate in national model training offered by the national and state offices. Typically within six months of employment, our healthy family staff are trained. And in the case of parents as teachers, our staff must be trained in the model before they can actually implement the program when they're working with enrolled families. As a result of our partnership with our local community services board, our staff also, some of our staff, not all, but some of our staff 
must comply with the CSB training requirements. So training is ongoing and occurs throughout the year. And it includes a multitude of topics that could be um, focused on prenatal care, um, understanding their responsibility as a mandated reporter or other areas such as child development, nutrition, health, um, employment, training. Uh, it just covers the range of what the entire family may benefit from. Um, and from a programmatic standpoint, that training includes documentation of the services that are being offered and delivered and the outcomes of those services. With that, I'm going to turn it over to David um, and allow him to share a little bit about what we are offering in our Family Empowerment Partnerships Unit. All right, thank you so much, Shardell, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, within the Prevention Bureau, I work within a multi-unit team called Family Empowerment Partnerships, as she said, and those programs are community and family development, the housing broker team, as well as employment services. Now, the housing broker team, more affectionately known as HBT here, um, works to address negative effects of homelessness in, on children, their families, and the community, while employment services facilitates our local view and snap at programs. And while both programs primarily focus on the adults in the household, the majority of these families do indeed have children. And as you may know, challenges with children can often create barriers for housing stability as well as employment. So for example, if a father has to leave his construction job multiple times in order to go to his child's school to address behavioral challenges, it can be difficult to maintain that employment thus putting a strain on the family income and potentially um, opening the door for housing instability. And in these cases, when that may occur, HBT and employment services will reach across program lines and refer children to and youth to the, uh, the family support partnerships that Shardell just spoke about or the top program that I'll speak about in a second here for services whenever appropriate. So there's really a continuum that we strive to maintain in order to fully serve all generations of our families that um, we work with. So speaking of that top program, I wanted to talk a bit about that. Um, they're within a unit um, that I have the privilege of directly supervising, which is community and family development. And um, that team is made up of two distinct programs, youth services and family and community education services or FCES, another acronym for everybody today. Uh, within those two teams, youth services focuses on intensive wraparound case management, the top program that I mentioned, and youth development, while FCES focuses on parenting education and asset-based community development. And those two programs really converge and work together to deliver outreach services, training, and um, as well as large-scale events for the community. So some of the objectives in the community and family development team include preventing out-of-home placement for youth, uh, strengthening family systems, positive youth development, uh, parental capacity building, and we really tackle these objectives through a combination of community-based and therapeutic service coordination, um, youth leadership and engagement programs, uh, parenting courses, workshops and trainings, um, as well as other types of awareness events and family programming. And here is where the, the two-gen model is really vital in this particular team, because we're able to assess and create custom service plans for families as well as their children. Um, we maintain a provider listing that allows us to connect those families to critical counseling and therapeutic needs that they may need. But we also um, are really proud that we're able to connect folks to the community. So we're able to fund and coordinate interest-based services for the entire family. And yes, that does include parents too. Include parents too. So for example, a mom, dad, or grandma can participate in an empowerment course with the Catalyst Effect, who's a, a local community partner of ours or parenting classes with us or Catch More Kids or financial management classes through HBT. Additionally, a parenting class participant may sign their child up for a youth program or attend a family program with the whole family, um, grandma, grandpa, and everybody else. Um, and not unlike the image you see on the, on the screen here, which was from the ABC grant program that we did a little while ago, um, where we hosted a paint party to educate families on a two generational topic, uh, social hosting, where a parent may casually allow a, an underage person to drink at a social gathering, like a wedding or uh, a New Year's Eve party or something like that. That's actually a mom and daughter pictured there. They don't have social hosting issues, but they wanted to come and have fun and learn about the topic too. So another program where we intentionally aim to serve multiple generations is our intergenerational prom, where we're able to bring a famed dance and a activity event to a local nursing home or a hospital. Uh, that program engages students from our Mayor's Youth Commission to serve elderly residents 
as well as just having fun with them dancing and eating and playing games and really reaching across multiple generations so that younger youth and senior citizens can mutually benefit from that interaction. Um, this produces outcomes that we can actually track, like reduce incidents in the home, uh, school and community, increased academic performance in youth, as well as that increased parent and child interaction that we're always striving for. Uh, these programs, see if I can change the slide on my end here. There we go. These programs are funded by city general funds. We also benefit from uh, access to the Promoting, Promoting Safe and Stable Families grant, um, which allows us additional community support funds as well as family preservation funds, um, as well as various other grants like that ABC grant that I mentioned in the other picture before. Um, right now we have about 10 staff total and in order for a worker on our team to really be equipped to effectively do the work that they need to do, there's a handful of trainings that we find important. Uh, the list that you see on the screen isn't exhaustive, but um, we include wraparound training, uh, the 40 developmental assets for our youth development staff, as well as our case managers, um, the nurturing parenting curriculum, uh, OASIS training, trauma-informed care is really important, um, and any specific training for conducting assessments uh, for the top program or for our parenting curriculum. So. That will wrap up community and family development in a nutshell, and I will go ahead and pass on to Miss Sonia Mitchell. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Again, I am Sonia Mitchell. I am the unit coordinator and family and consumer sciences agent at the local extension office in Newport News. So just in case you're unfamiliar with extension, we are an educational extension of the two universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State. And we are also a NIFA funded program, which is the National Institute for Food and Agriculture. Um, specifically in Newport News, we are partially funded by Newport News DHS, and so we partner directly with them. And we offer community and evidence-based programs to Newport News families. And we do house these programs and local facilities that families can easily access in the community, such as community centers, churches, schools, food banks, farmers markets, and more. So I wanted to pull out a few of our existing two gen programming that we have right now, which is our family focus program, family nutrition and financial education outreach, which includes SNAP-Ed and FNET programming, our junior master gardeners program and our 4-H youth development programs. So a little about each of those. Uh, family focus is our parenting education program that is currently housed in York and James City County, but they also serve uh, Newport News families. They provide parenting, um, parent-child play groups and events where parents can learn to create structured play and interact with other families in their community. They also have a preschool component at Family Focus and an intergenerational component, similar to what David just talked about, that allows the preschool age kids to interact with seniors about twice a week to encourage positive bonding across the age span. As far as our uh, financial and nutrition outreach, um, this allows families as a whole of all ages, no matter what their makeup is, to participate in education that teaches the entire family to develop positive skills in managing their finances and developing nutritional health. So the picture that you see on the screen is actually a picture from one of my Real Money Real World simulations, which is a financial literacy activity for you to learn what it's like to pay bills every month like their parents. Um, so the parents have the opportunity to monitor their kids in the simulation and observe what financial decisions the kids make and where some education is needed. For our Junior Master Gardener program, it allows youth and their families to learn about growing their own food. Um, this program is especially catered to families living in food deserts and it uses, a, it uses our extensions farm to table and educating families how to utilize community gardens to create nutritional meals at home. And finally, our 4-H Youth Development Program promotes positive decision-making skills and leadership in youth. Parents are allowed to participate in the 4-H program as club directors and even volunteers at our summer camp, which is coming up in July, um, to assist in being positive role models to Newport News youth. So these are just some of our programs and our main objectives are to prevent child abuse and neglect, school readiness, positive parent-child play, family financial health, optimal health and wellness, and of course that environmental sustainability piece. Our outcomes are directly related to the objective showing improvement in vital areas such as financial nutrition health, family interaction and bonding, and connection to a lot of community resources. So the picture that you see on this slide is actually a grandparent with her grandchild learning how to pot and grow tomato plants from their home. 
Um, so we are funded through a vast um, array of places, USDA, NIFA, as I mentioned before. We do have some of those uh, city general funds from Newport News. The Family Focus Program is actually uh, funded by a VDSS grant. And we also do receive local grants and donations and in-kind donations as well. We have uh, 10 staff members in total, and that does not include the 50 plus volunteers that help us run our programs. And so when it comes to training, uh, Extension has a vast array of training themselves that we do for all of our programs. We do test and develop our programs through our logic model and theory of change. We also uh, put agents and staff through the program implementation and evaluation training. There are certain onboarding or new staff requirements that um, agents are asked to take. And then something that I didn't mention on the slide is we do have our staff um, and volunteers take civil rights training and risk management training. So that is a little bit about the extension service in Newport News. And so thank you, Sonia and David um, and uh, Kiara, thank you for having us. I think for us, this was an opportunity for us to share um, what we were doing in, in Newport News and the collaborative nature of the work that we do in Newport News um, and not just within the department, but with our community partners as well as Rusty pointed out. It's not necessarily what you're doing in your agency. It's also how you're engaged in the community that's important and vital um, to the work that we're doing. So thank you for having us. And our contact information is there. If you need additional information, we'd be happy to you know, take any questions we're not able to answer today. Thank you so much. You all have such a comprehensive program. And um, it was wonderful to have you wrap us up today. Um, and just speaking in, in regards to all three of your programs, there are so many elements that I think are just fantastic to model. And I hope that um, other local representatives that are present today can, can see some of those elements in their own programs. And you know, we're looking forward to continue to elevate you all's work uh, because as Rusty mentioned, we are already doing two gen. So let's continue to highlight, collaborate, and you know, improve uh, through watching each other. So we have a few minutes left. So we wanna open up the chat. Um, so if you have any lingering questions, we have a few minutes to ask our panelists. I did see a chat question um, in regards to the training that uh, Ms. Mitchell mentioned. Um, do you mind repeating the last two trainings that you said were um, mandatory for your staff? Sure, and I did drop it in the chat. It's our civil rights training and our risk management training that all of our staff, including volunteers, are um, mandated to take. Awesome, thank you. So if anyone has any other questions, uh, there are about 200 of you left on the call. And you can, uh, when you type in your question, you can choose to have it visible to just the panelists or to everyone that's present. Okay. I'm not seeing any more questions. Will, do you see any extra questions? Um, not seeing any. Um, okay. Give it a few more seconds here, just anybody's typing anything and we ask you not to hop off just yet um, we do have a couple of evaluative questions that we'd like to ask you especially in preparation for our next lunch and learn which will take place on july 12th from 1 to 2 p.m all right uh quickly where on fusion will this information be housed Kiara, you want to take that sure so you can always visit the Office of Innovation and Strategic Initiatives Fusion page. We have a list of all of our work and we have a page dedicated specifically to, um, to Gen. So you can go to our Office Fusion page, click on our to Gen page, and we have resources from the Aspen Institute. We have recordings from the previous convenings and we'll be sure to link the recording to this session along with um, some of the accompanying uh, slide presentations. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. All right. So before everyone logs off, um, I would like to pull up some of our last two questions that we want to just get your input um, before we check off today. So on a scale of one to five, how helpful was this session in strengthening your understanding of 2Gen? And again, thank you to our lovely panel. You all really helped um, provide, uh, you know, actual framework and work in practice and related to 2Gen. And we are committed to continuing these sort of um, peer educational spaces so that hopefully one day we can get all fives when we're talking about <laughs> strengthening our understanding of 2Gen after these sessions. And thank you all for participating. This feedback is valuable and we will be sure to make any changes as necessary um, as we move forward to ensure that we're meeting these goals. Thank you. You want to hop to the next one? Sure. All right. And then this is just in a, an open-ended um, entry where you can type in just any thoughts about how we can improve for next session. We really want to make sure we're ta tailoring these events to what your agency needs and how we can best help to facilitate the implementation of 2GEM programming or just to simply serve as a resource. And as always, Kiara and I are, uh, we're open books and our lines are open. So please feel free to reach out to us individually. We'll be sending out our emails. And don't be shy to contact us. Um, we will make sure that the contact information for our presenters is available per their slides. Um, and we'll also make sure that you have contact information for both Will and myself so that we can continue to receive input and recommendations for improvement. And thank you so much for this feedback. We will certainly use this um, to improve on our next session. Awesome. This is all really, really helpful. Thank you. So in conclusion, I just want to thank you all for your time, especially our, our lovely panelists. And thank you for all the attendees for joining us today. And like we mentioned, we hope to continue to offer these spaces so that we can share in peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and just do our best to, to expand 2Gen across our VDSS and LDSS network. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. I guess we, uh, that's where we.